everyone, um, I promise you guys a horror story. This is actually not horror horror um, because it's uh, based off of like a two minute story I heard when I was little, but this is actually my story. But I got at the idea from something and I'll, I'll tell it to you later. Um, I was actually in the tub uh, writing it um, today my hair's still dripping in the back <laughs> and I hope I'm not ruining the dress um, that I have on right now uh, I wrote it on my phone and uh, really it it's a really long story but I had to make it really short uh, and I hope you like it anyway here I go our story begins with a refugee nation led by a beautiful princess and her ambassador. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful nation that was attacked by things not of this realm. The country was rich in resources and minerals, so when the royal family, along with their people, abandoned their lands, they were still very wealthy. although they were a nation without their land, without a place to truly rest their heads. The refugee nation, even without their homeland, were still the wealthiest nation in the world. Many other nations sought to take advantage of this rich but very unfortunate nation, rich but very unfortunate people. They would promise land to them as refugees, but the host nation, they would always plan to slaughter the refugee citizens and their royal family, take their wealth. Each time a host nation tried to take advantage of the refugee nation, the host nation would lose every citizen that raised a hand against their new guest. Of course, the re of course, the refugees would be then asked to leave that host nation. The princess, being a considerate being, would oblige the request. This was odd because these rich, beautiful, intelligent refugees could invade any country they wanted. But for some reason, they would not. Within three months, most of the world's nations stopped coveting the riches of the refugee nation. This is mainly because they knew what happened to those other nations who betrayed them. Most nations realized it was better to let them pass through peacefully without engaging in violence. And when they did, well, those nations actually received blessings, great crops, better water, Wonderful weather. As I said, most nations realized it was better to let them pass through peacefully without engaging in violence. The island of the West was not such a nation. The island of the West was a desperate nation, poorly managed and fighting plague. The West King decided to have, the West King decided, well, they have a princess, we have a prince, they need a home, we need money, we'll offer them a deal. Your princess and wealth for a new homeland. This request came by messenger. And even though the princess was the true ruler, it was her father who was given the message. The princess for the ambassador. He requested that they just buy land and live there. But both the kings knew that only a marriage could make solid the joining of two nations. 
Otherwise, I mean, they could take your money, kill the refugees, or we could take the land and kill the people who already originally lived there. So it had to be one nation, which meant the princess would have to marry the prince. Okay, so the ambassador requested that they just pay for a place on the island, but both kings insisted that a deal could, not, could only be fully honored by marriage. After three days, an ironclad contract was negotiated and agreed to. There were very odd requests within this contract. The number one oddest request and the most important the blue ribbon around the princess's neck was never to be touched by anyone but her ambassador. And number two, anywhere the princess was, the ambassador was allowed to be as well. Anywhere the princess was. Bathroom, bedroom, anywhere. The king and the prince of the West Island found these requests to be odd but realized there would be no marriage if these two requests were omitted from the contract. The wedding took place on an island, and once the vows were complete, something wonderful happened. Every ailment of every original West Island citizen was gone. Everyone felt happy, everyone but the prince. You see, according to the princess, princess's ambassador, the princess had taken a vow of silence to ask the spirits to protect her people. In fact, it was this vow that protected the refugees during the invasion of their homeland and during their travels to their now new country. The blue ribbon that was, a, the blue ribbon was a symbol of that vow and it could never be removed. So not only did the prince have a woman he could not talk to, but he also had a boundary he had to respect. He did not like boundaries. The princess was exceptionally beautiful. She was also very wise. Her ambassador served, her, her ambassador served as her voice, her guard, her confidant. The princess would write letters to communicate with everyone else but her ambassador. The princess and the, bas and the ambassador could communicate with just a look. Servants and royalty were expected to be close, but this ambassador was no servant. He had an otherworldly beauty. He could speak every language in the world and every leader with the exception of the princess was terrified of him. A year passed. With the help of the ambassador and the princess, the island began to thrive. The ambassador and the princess would negotiate treaties and trade deals throughout the world they were known as fair and kind and extremely beautiful. The island of the West became a land of where illness, death, and disease did not exist. The princess gave birth to a girl. The nation was happy. The prince was not. He believed he he was too virile of a man to have a girl. All of his mistresses had only boys. When the ambassador was away, he accused the princess of having an affair, of course, with the ambassador. <laughs> she sat silently, unable to defend herself, holding the prince's daughter in her arms. Tears streamed down her face, 
while he, while she was berated by the prince. The princess did not cry for herself. She cried for her child. She cried for her daughter. As the prince's rage began to escalate, he lunged for the blue ribbon around her neck and he felt the ambassador's the ambassador crushed his right hand, breaking every bone. The ambassador pulled the prince close. Pulled the prince close into him and said, that child is unfortunately yours. The princess honors her contracts and has been faithful. The prince was about to retort some insane insult when the ambassador gave the prince a look that snapped his mouth shut. The prince shook so hard he pissed himself. The princess walked from the room carrying her baby with a steel resolve for her people and for her daughter she would make this marriage work. If she had not had such a resolve, the ambassador would have crushed every bone in the prince's body. Two weeks had passed. The princess had taken to sleeping in the nursery to protect her daughter. The ambassador at this time was negotiating a treaty between two warring nations. You see, normally the princess and the ambassador would be together, but since she's taking care of her baby, he went alone, leaving her alone. The princess was tired and she fell asleep breastfeeding her baby. With the ambassador gone, the prince decided to take his revenge on the princess. He decided to desecrate her vow and remove the blue ribbon from her neck. As he untied the ribbon, he had a vision. It was the princess. She was gallantly fighting invaders who had come in the night. They weren't human and they were ripping apart her soldiers. No matter how many she killed, they kept coming. Her intelligence, her beauty, her strength could not save her. As this horrid thing was about to deal her a killing blow, she said in her full spirit, with my life, protect my people. The monster then knocked her head from her neck, her head flew across the hall and was caught by the ambassador. Waking from the vision, the prince tried to stop the blue ribbon from slipping from her neck, but it was too late. Her head slid from her body and rolled through the door of the nursery and to the feet of her ambassador. The blue ribbon was the only thing keeping her alive. The blue ribbon was the only thing keeping her people alive. The blue ribbon was the only thing healing the people of the West from their plague. The ambassador knelt down. He picked up the head of his beloved princess. This man was no ambassador. This man was no man. He was an angel. He was the angel of death. And in one thought, Every 
head of every refugee fell from their body. The island of the West's original citizens stood in horror while the bodies lined the streets and the homes. Death kept the prince alive to watch while a portal to hell opened up and the demons ripped apart every human left alive on the island. The angel of death then removed the child from the arms of the headless body of the princess. They left the island. He left the prince alive, there, alone, with the rotting corpses of his once great and now destroyed nation. So originally, originally, this is how I was told the story when I was four years old. There was this princess and she had a blue ribbon on and um, she met this prince and this prince really loved this princess because she was hot and beautiful and stuff. And like, um, they start dating and they would go out and they would meet in the forest and they were walking around. And one day he just kept saying, why do you have to keep the blue ribbon on? And she was like, no, I have to keep the blue ribbon on. And then one day they got married and on their wedding night, they slept together. And then while the princess was asleep, the prince removed the ribbon from her neck and her head rolled off her body. And I guess the moral of that tale was is that, you know, the scary part is that he was screwing a dead girl. But I always thought that was wrong because uh, she asked him not to touch that ribbon that boundary should have been respected. So I told the story like this instead. I think my story's better. Anyway, happy Halloween, and I'll tell you guys some of my nightmares tomorrow.